the best looking church in the region. Turn to somebody and say, you know what, you look good. Just tell them, tell them they look good. <laughs> when I was growing up, I grew up in University Place, which is a small town, well it's actually a city now, by the Narrows Bridge. And in my backyard of the home my parents had, they had three trees. They had a plum tree, a cherry tree, and then a fir tree. And this fir tree was very tall, and I was not allowed to climb it. I was a climber as a kid. I was always climbing. I'd climb on the roof of my parents' house, and my neighbors would call and tell on me and say, your kid's on the roof. But there was two fruit trees, like I said, the plum tree and the cherry tree. And what I found, and they had grapefruit. There was tons of fruit, tons of cherries, tons of, of plums. And I found that the higher you go, the better the fruit is because you're closer to the sun. It would ripen. Because if you've ever eaten a cherry that's green or a plum that's green, it's just disgusting. But, but I was always like daring enough to go to the top of the trees and I would just sit up there and eat fruit all day. And I was thinking about that. You know, we're, we're going to be talking this week and for another couple weeks about the fruit of the Spirit. And the better the fruit is, the closer we are to the sun, or the closer we are to Jesus. And I want us to keep that in our minds and in our hearts as we worship this morning. Can we pray? Father God, I'm so grateful that we can come into your house, come into your presence. Lord, be amongst our brothers and sisters in Christ. Lord, I pray that you would be honored by everything that takes place this morning, and you would bless us with your presence. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.
Now, I know some of you are thinking, this is not typically where we recite this. And the others of you are, I haven't noticed. <laughs> there are a few of us that wake up at three in the morning and think about these things. And so I, 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 I petitioned the, the worship ministry to uh, start saying the Apostles' Creed at the beginning of the service. And here's why. There is such a powerful declaration when we as the body of Christ say, this is what we believe. And when we begin to open our worship service with this unified declaration, there's power behind it. Would you say it with me? I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Amen. You can remain standing if you're able.
join me in prayer. O oh God, the strength of those who hope in you, be present and hear our prayers. And because in the weakness of our mortal nature, we can do nothing good without you. Give us the help of your grace, so that in keeping your commandments, we may please you in will and deed. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. 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 You can go ahead and have a seat. Continue our worship through our confession. In the name of the Father, Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Have mercy on us, O God, according to your loving kindness. In your great compassion, blot out our offenses. You, O God, know our sin. Nothing is hidden from you. Therefore, you are justified when you speak, and you are right. When you judge, may this hero God, 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 hide your face from our sins. Grant us mercy, even though we are unworthy. Create us in our God. Give us the joy of your saving help, and sustain us with your bountiful spirit. Have mercy on us, O God, according to your loving kindness. In your great compassion, God, our offenses. Let us take a moment to confess our sins before the Lord. Oh, 
Almighty God. We have fallen short of your glory. We have done things which you are not able to teach. We have failed to do things that have been done by our neighbor. We confess that sin has come upon you and us. People of God, you have made your confessions before the Lord. Therefore, you are promised forgiveness through faith in Jesus Christ alone. So by the authority of our God, our Father, and Jesus Christ, his only Son, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, I boldly and confidently announce the forgiveness of your sins. You have been washed clean and purified of your sins. Rejoice and be glad, for you are a child of God. Praise be to God. Amen. Amen. Now we have Miss May Mullen. May Bethany Mullen with a hyphen. You can read mine too. Okay. The first reading is from Paul's second letter to the Corinthians, the fourth chapter. Since we have the same spirit of faith according to what has been written, I believed, and so I spoke. We also believe, and so we also speak, knowing that he who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us with, also with Jesus and bring us with you into his presence. For it is all for your sake, so that your grace extends to more and more people and may increase thanksgiving to the glory of God. So we do not lose heart. Through our outer self is wasting away. Our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this... Light momentary reflection is preparing us for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison, as we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are un that for the things that are seen are transit, but the things that are unseen are eternal. For we know that is if the tent that is our eternal earthly home is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternally in the heavens. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. This reading is from Psalm 130. Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. O Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my mind. If you, O Lord, should mark inequities, O Lord, who could stand? I wait for the Lord, my soul waits, and in his word I hope. My soul waits for the Lord, more than watch and for the morning, more than watch and for the morning. O Israel, hope in the Lord, for with the Lord there is steadfast love, and with him is plentiful redemption. And he will redeem Israel through all his iniquities. Here ends this reading. Very good. Stay right here. So just a quick announcement. Two weeks from today is Confirmation Sunday. And one of my pastors growing up, he said, I never have to worry about my church as long as I have young people. And we never have to worry about the future of our church as long as we have young people. So two weeks from today, we're going to have Confirmation Sunday. Let everyone who is able Come on out at 5 p.m. that night. Let's support our young people. They have gone through a very rigorous discipleship training process. The sacrament, everything they've gone through has been a lot because I've been the one putting it on their table. All while they're going to school and sports and normal kid activities. So June 23rd, uh, 5 p.m., come out and support these young people. Now sit down. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll invite all the, the children to come on up. Yeah, guys, come on. Good morning. How are you?
How are you this morning? Good. So what have you been doing in this lovely weather we've been blessed with? Anything special? Oh. Uh-huh. Yeah, who? A pool party. No, we're talking pool as in water, right? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Oh, good. So brother's home. We're very proud of you, by the way. Okay. Okay. Um, today, Pastor will talk to us about life in the spirit or fruit in the spirit. So what is the spirit? We talked about, I was, I'm sorry, I wasn't here last week, but anyway, we talked about the spirit for lots of weeks. So what is the spirit? Can we see it? No. Okay. But it can affect us. Okay. Um, we are told that the, in the world, the world, the world will know us that we are Christians by our love, by what we do. Um, the results of that love are ten, um, ten factors that indicate that we are Christian. It's the fruit of the Spirit, or the results of the Spirit, are love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faith, gentleness, and self-control. Okay. okay. For an example, and Pastor mentioned trees this morning, that... Um, <laughs> so, with the tree, the fruit is what is produced by the tree. Yeah. I hope this is going to win it. Okay, okay. So, as with the tree, okay, this is a fruit tree. Do you know what kind of tree it is? No. Would you? Well, it's a good guess, but you're not supposed to. Oh, guess, yeah. Okay, but you saw the little apple. Okay, so this is an apple. Okay. So with the apple, with the tree, where does it start? As a seed. It does, and it starts in the ground. It's rooted in the, in the, in the ground. As with our faith, we are rooted in the, we, we come from a long line of Christian people. It starts out with our Lord. The, the root of the tree would be our Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, our faith. Okay. The, the trunk of the tree would be Jesus, because he comes out to us, and we, we follow him. On the, on the edges of the trunk, are what do we find on the edges of the trunk? The branches. So the branches come out from Jesus. Where okay? Where is the fruit produced on the tree? On the edges of the branches. So we are the edges of the branches. So we are the fruit of the tree. If the tree did not have, what does the tree also need to grow? A lot of care. So a lot of water. It needs sunshine. And. Actually, with the tree, it needs to be pollinated. But anyway, we're not going to get into that. <laughs> okay. Okay. So, the brand, okay, so we are the branches. So we are the examples. We are the fruit of the tree. And I want us to say together those uh, those things that we are we present represent the fruit of, and we can say it together: love, love, joy, joy peace. peace. Long suffering, long suffering, kindness, kindness, goodness, goodness, faithfulness, faithfulness, gentleness, gentleness, self control, self control, and with those things we can change the world. Hmm. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your sending us the Holy Spirit. Help us, Lord, to have the faith and the strength to always follow you. In Jesus' name, Amen. So hold on. Each have an apple. 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 Have an ap
Wonderful. Thank you, Judy, so much. Uh, just a couple of quick announcements as the kids are getting settled. Uh, love the kids. Thank you to all the parents and grandparents and aunties and uncles who got the kids ready uh, for church this morning. That's a ministry in itself, and I'll never stop saying it, so thank you very much for doing that. Uh, just a couple quick announcements. So, and this is my favorite announcement. I only get to say it for a month, but we have a toilet paper drive. That is going on for the adult women's home right down the street, the Teen Challenge Center. Uh, I guess the, the question was asked, how can we support you? They said, we need toilet paper. And we said, okay. So if you, if you have some toilet paper, bring it all month um, and we'll, we'll donate it to them. It's a, it's a big need they have. They have a great ministry right down the street, kind of by the library, uh, where they serve women who have come out of abusive relationships and prison and, and addiction. And what a great way to... Uh, Share the love of Jesus by offering simple and practical support. Um, and then just to kind of be aware, as it's June right now, we get into July and August. Starting in September, we are going to be having Sunday school for kids, and we're going to be having Sunday school for adults, and that will start right about 11 o'clock. So it's going to add another dynamic to our Sunday morning uh, worship services. So uh, just kind of, and we'll talk more and more about specific details, but we need to just start kind of being ready as summer kind of winds down after August that we're going to be offering Sunday school again for kids and for adults, and it'll be a great time in God's Word. Also, we have uh, a petition out in the, in the North X, petition I-266, and that's to put a stop on uh, the ban for natural gas. Um, so if you want to go ahead and sign that, it's not a political issue at all. It's just we need to make sure that we have uh, uh, natural gas available for our citizens. They want to ban it for some reason. And so it's a great way to really just kind of stand up for our communities and saying we need choice and we need gas. So uh, you can sign that if you haven't already. Um, I think that's the last announcement that I have to make. Uh, so please stand as we read today's scripture. This is uh, Galatians, Paul's letter to the Galatians, chapter 5, verse 16 through 26. But I say, walk in the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of rage, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. This is the word of the Lord. Praise you, o Christ. And you can go ahead and have a seat. Now we're going to take the next few weeks and we're going to examine the fruits of the Spirit. We will look at three per week and really examine how the Holy Spirit wants to grow and bear this fruit in our lives. And I just, I gotta, I gotta pause for a second. I just remember, next week is Father's Day. So there's a sign up out there uh, in the narthex for those who want to bring cookies, I believe. Uh, check out in the narthex for the information on that. Um, now back to the but back to the sermon. I believe one distinction the Holy Spirit wants to make is that He is the one who grows and bears the fruits in our lives. This isn't a discipline. Okay, We're not trying to discipline ourselves into love and, and, and these things. It's a work of the Spirit in our lives. It's His active work in our spirits and His 
alone. And I think bearing the fruits of the Spirit is one of the greatest miracles of modern day. I mean, what an amazing miracle to be able to love, to, to have joy, to have patience. Those are miracles. Matthew twelve twenty three says, Either make the tree good and its fruit bad, or, or, or fruit good, or make the tree bad and its fruit bad, for a tree is known by its fruit. We are all in an internal battle between our spirits and our flesh, aren't we? One of those, you know, one of them wants to control our bodies, our wills, our emotions, our decisions, our thoughts, the way we think. And Paul is exhorting the church in Galatia, and it's still exhorting us today to live according to the Holy Spirit. So how will we know if we are following the works of the flesh or the works of the Spirit? We will know by the kind of fruit our lives bear. And Paul makes a very interesting distinction here. He notes that there are desires and works of the flesh, but there's fruit of the Spirit. Works are something we do. Fruit is something that comes from within. And I want to take a moment to look at the desires and the works for a moment. Now, the word desire is a Greek word. Ep, or ep, e, the, mi, a. And it means craving, longing, lust for what is forbidden. And works is a Greek word, ergon. And it means deeds to accomplish by hand, art, industry, or mind. What our flesh desires and lusts after, it will produce in our lives. Paul lists three categories of works in this passage. Uh, in other words, if we give in to the desires of our flesh, this is what will be accomplished in our lives. Okay? He, he, he lists a few sensual sins. Sexual immorality, impurity, and drunkenness. Those are sensual sins. He talks about superstitious sins. Idolatry and sorcery. And then, of course, he talks about sins that are social. Enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, and envy. <coughs> If we have inherited salvation and have been born again into Jesus Christ, we are at war with these things. All of these works will keep us from inheriting the kingdom of God. And they will not only keep us from inheriting eternal life if we continue to reject Christ, but they will keep us from our participation in what God is doing here on earth. While so many of these works and desires of the flesh are pretty self-explanatory, I want to point out, I believe there are two that have a way of sneaking into the church and into the body of Christ unaware. I mean, not living word, but like the churches down the street and those other churches. You know, not us, obviously. The first one, I believe, and I know because I can be guilty of it at times, and that's idolatry. When we think about idolatry, we think about worshiping, you know, golden statues in the Bible and Baal and Dagon and all those uh, uh, th those gods in the Bible, but in reality, an idol is anything we put at a higher value than God. Something that we worship. I mean, it can be money, it can be a business, it can be a person, it can be a hobby, it can be a passion, it can be in any anything. And in reality, those things, when submitted to God, are beautiful things and gifts from God. You know, I heard someone say to me once, you know, I don't like to come to church because I don't want to give up my, my family time. I don't want to give up time with my children. I don't want to give up time with, with that I need at home. And when I, I hear that saying, when I hear that, I'm like, oh, so what you're saying is you don't want to surrender your greatest offering to the Lord. And you've made those things, maybe unintentionally, maybe intentionally, an idol before God. You see, my children belong to God, not me. And I, I, I had better make sacrifices to raise my children in the house of the Lord. My kids have grown up as pastor's kids. Ask them how much time they've spent in church. Okay? Well, actually, probably don't. Well, go ahead. A lot. <laughs> when idolatry creeps into the life of a believer, or dare I say, a pastor, many things can become an idol. The church building can be an idol, the service an idol, the music an idol, the finances an idol. My ministry to the church can even be an idol. Things that are meant for God, we take back from God and build them around ourselves. The second thing I think that sneaks into the church sometimes 
and I don't mean the other churches down the street, is strife. Simply means contention in a relationship or between groups. Genesis 26, 19 through 22, when Isaac was looking for a place to, to, to build his home, it says this, When Isaac's servant dug in the valley and found there a spring of water, the herdsmen of Gerar quarreled with Isaac's herdmen, saying, Hey, that water's ours. So he called the name Esek, because they contended with him. Then they went and dug another well, and they quarreled over that also. So he called its name Sitna. And he moved from there and dug another well, and they did not quarrel over it. So he called its name Rehoboth, meaning for the Lord has made room for us, and we shall be fruitful in the land. I think at times we hold on to things that we create, and I am just as guilty. We like to prepare offerings, but we don't like to sacrifice them. Let me say that again. We love to prepare offerings, or let me internalize this. I love to prepare offerings, but I don't always like to sacrifice it. And what does this create in the family of God? It can breed mistrust. It can cause us to hide and protect what we are supposed to be putting on the altar of God. For example, a few years ago, I was at a church down in Ording, and I worked for about 18 months to create an altar ministry, because after the service, we would have like two or three couples that were trained to pray for different people's needs and, and, and minister to people as, as needed. And so with something like that, you need a little administration, you need some planning behind it. And I worked for 18 months to, to uh, put together this handbook and do all these trainings and do all these things. And I worked really hard and I was really proud of how the fruit was coming and it was really equipping people to minister to the body of Christ. But when I left that position, the, the pastor who was going to take over that ministry called me up said, Eric, I need you to send me over all the paperwork and all the handbooks and all the stuff for, for this particular ministry. And I will never forget, I sat there and I thought, I don't want to. I worked on that. That was, my, that was 18 months of phone calls and trainings and all this stuff. I, I don't want to give that up. That's mine. But then I, I, I felt convicted by the Holy Spirit. And I felt like he said to me, that was never yours. That never belonged to you. That was always for me. And looking back, I realized how silly I was being. I was like, why would I even care? I don't. We do that as people. We take, it's good to take ownership of things that we work on, but it's not good to hold them back from their ultimate purpose, and that's putting them in the hands of God. Those of us who have chosen to follow and surrender Jesus have the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives to overcome fleshly desires and keep the work of the flesh from being displayed in our lives. And it's funny, all the things that I just listed, or that Paul listed, excuse me, they come natural to us. And they're kind of inside the fabric of our nature, that sin nature. But something happens when we surrender to the work and infilling of the Holy Spirit in our lives. What happens is that our lives begin to bear spiritual fruit. Fruit is grown, it develops, it comes to life in order to give life to others. We need to remember that we are contributing and influencing the world around us, whether we realize it or not. Paul lists nine fruits that we bear in our lives, fruit that can be seen, recognized, and tasted. We're going to look at three over the next couple minutes. The first one is love. Now, the word love has been devaluated and perverted by the English language. In our culture, love is something or someone who gives us a feeling or euphoric encounter. In, in, in our culture, love serves us. But in Scripture, love is an outward expression of who God is. It's, it's the Greek word agape, and it means faithfulness, benevolence, commitment, or an act of will. Romans 5.8 simply it says this, But God shows his love for us, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Love is not something that serves us, it is the way in which we serve others. Culture has it twisted. They say love is love. They say love wins. In other words, love is about me and what I want it to be. Love serves my des desires, my sensual needs, my imaginations. But the Bible teaches us that love causes us to surrender every part of our life to God. 
and for our fellow man. Love is uncomfortable. Love may bring you pain. Love will ask you to give up ways of thinking. Love will ask you to give up behaviors, thoughts, attitudes, habits, and the like. I love my wife and children. It is my job, because I love my wife and children, to put myself in harm's way should something be a threat to my kids, not my older kids. My <laughs> oldest son's a trained Marine. He's a combat trainee. You're good. <laughs> but it's, it's my job to protect my family because I love them. And that love will drive me to sacrifice my life. My son Elijah and his cousin Eli are both Marines and they're both home on leave. Glad that you guys are here. John 15, 12 through 13 says this, this is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, than someone laid down his life for his friends. When the Holy Spirit is active in our lives, uh, we will love the way Jesus taught us to love, and it will naturally push back against the desires of the flesh. We need to set the standard of biblical love in our lives so the world will see the true sacrifice of Jesus. The next fruit is the fruit of joy will show up in our lives. Joy is contentment and satisfaction regardless of circumstances. Joy remains consistent through all of life's ups and downs. Hebrews 12.2 says this, Looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despised the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Jesus went through the worst of circumstances in that crucifixion, was affected by those circumstances, felt the pain of those circumstances, but was content to go through it knowing what would happen on the other end. In other words, three days later, resurrection defeated sin and the grave. One word that drives me crazy is the word, well, it doesn't drive me crazy, happiness. Like, happiness is based upon circumstances. You know, I talk to parents, and they'll say, my job is to make my kids happy. Okay, and while the sentiment is good, I like that sentiment, but happiness takes effort. It takes something from outside the situation to bring happiness, and it will continue need to be fed, excuse me. I'm not saying happiness is bad, but it is based on circumstances. Joy allows us spiritual fulfillment with our God regardless of circumstances. That's why it's a fruit of the Spirit. That's why it's a work of the Spirit in our lives for us to be joyful even when the season is unbearable. I worked in an IHOP, an International House of Pancakes, when I was in high school. And it was like the most mismanaged business. I was 17 years old and I didn't know anything about business and I knew this business was managed poorly. That's how bad it was. But it was a, it was a good after school job because I could hang out with my friends and you know kind of do whatever I wanted. But there was two customers that would come in and they would come in every day at 3.15 on the money. And their name was George and Aloha. They were missionaries. They were... Uh, they, grew, they met in Hawaii, and they spent most of their adult life uh, traveling around Africa, preaching and teaching the Word. They'd come in, and every day they'd sit at the same table at 3.15. George would order two tall glasses of iced tea with just a little bit of ice on the top, and he would put like 10 sugars in them. Now, George had had a stroke two years prior, and he, he didn't speak very well. They were in their... They're late 80s, early 90s, wonderful couple. And Aloha, the wife, spoke for him. So he couldn't, he could say a few words, but she knew what he was talking about. She'd be like, oh, George just wants this. And, you know, she just interpreted for him. When they would come into the IHOP and sit down, the whole, like, all the workers would come out and they would just sit around while George and Aloha talked about the Lord. And we're talking about, People who had no knowledge of God, no interest in God. But when it came to George and Aloha, they would stop and listen to the stories these missionaries would tell. When George passed away, I remember going to his, 
his um, uh, celebration of life memorial service. And people who came up to spoke would say, this guy, if you would get him talking about the glory of God, he would not stop. He would monopolize the entire conversation all night. It was super annoying, but it was amazing because he was so full of the joy of the Lord. Now, I never heard George's voice, but I saw his eyes, and his eyes overflowed with the joy of the Lord. We must set a high standard of joy that will be contagious to those around us. Last one I want to talk about, and I'm almost done, is peace. Now, peace is a Greek word, irene, and it means assurance, or assurance of the soul of its salvation through Christ. How beautiful is it to be at peace with our God? Our flesh wants the war against our Creator, wants to exalt ourselves above Him. All of society wants to create a God in their own image. But we are at peace with our Creator. And you know, we're seeing this move of deconstructionism in our culture. We're seeing history be deconstructed, the family be deconstructed, morality, gender and sexuality, truth, uh, even biblical doctrine be deconstructed. At the very core reason for all of this is that we're searching for a God that we can create and thus create the peace through. We want to manufacture a work of peace with God. What is it about humanity that wants to make that peace? John Lennon wrote a famous song. I believe he wrote it on his honeymoon in 1969. It was, Give Peace a Chance. Anybody ever heard of that song? It's actually a great song. My mom was a huge Beatles fan, so we listened to it. It was in a time of anti-war protests and movement. It said, just give peace a chance. Like, it was just so obvious. Like, peace was so achievable, and we're just rejecting it. See, we have to understand this about peace. Peace is not the absence of conflict. I believe peace is the presence of God in the middle of the conflict. We're going to have conflict in our lives. That's just the way it is. And if we try to shun the conflict or get rid of it, it just creates more conflict, okay? I I can't be the only one who notices that. True peace comes from our peace with God. When we repent of our sins, he offers us freedom from those sins. Freedom from guilt. Freedom from shame. That is when we have true peace. We can be at peace when the world maligns us and reviles us. We can be at peace when other sects of Christianity calls us names and work to discredit us. What we are beginning to see, and I've noticed this, is we're beginning to see denominations come together. I love it. We're beginning to see denominations come together. We're seeing it in this region right now. The Baptists and the Lutherans and the Pentecostals and the Presbyterians, and they're all coming together. And what's happening is, There's a uniting happening in the body of Christ. It may take a few generations, but we'll see this uniting in the body of Christ. And anything that is anti-biblical doctrine is going to be purged and thrown away. Because we know a tree by its fruit. Philippians 4, 7 says, And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Trusting in God sets the standard of peace in our spirits and in our minds. Trusting in God sets the standards of peace in our spirit and in our minds. We will begin to bear the fruits of the Spirit when our lives are filled with the Spirit. And our lives are filled with the Spirit when we invite the Holy Spirit. And I'm going to invite the ushers to come up. So the homework this week is to consider these things. Look at, my, look at your life, look at my life, look at my spirit, look at your spirit. And let's say, am I bearing the fruits of the spirit or the work of the flesh? <coughs> Excuse me. And as we kind of switch gears here to thinking about offering, I had a friend, he emailed me this little video. Uh, this week where a pastor was explaining, and I I love what he said. He was explaining why he tied to his church. I think it was a local church. And he gave a few reasons, but there was a few that really stuck to me. And I want to share them with you. These are a few reasons why it is important to tie. Number one is it provides for God's house. It provides for God's house. Number two, 
tithe and offering, it shows that I trust God. It shows that I trust God with my finances. And it reminds me, number three, that God is my provider. <clears throat> not my paycheck, you know, not my banking system, not my investments. God is my provider. And number four, I think this is really good, especially for me, is it pulls greed. It takes greed and self-reliance out of my heart. Because I have to rely on God if I'm obeying Him with my finances. And it also creates a mindset where everything else in my life knows that God is first. And if we consider those things as we give our tithes and our offerings, what we will see is a beautiful act of worship and surrender. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for this opportunity to examine our lives and our hearts against your word. Lord, I pray that we would make healthy assessments of our own heart before you. Now take this offering, multiply it for the furthering of your kingdom here in Graham. We recognize that everything we have as Living Word Lutheran Church comes from you and your hand alone. Thank you so much. In Jesus' name, amen.